Good evening. I'm psychiatrist Jay Falver, live from Fort Wayne, Indiana. Welcome to Matters of the Mind. Now in its 26th year, Matters of the Mind is a live call-in program where you have the chance to choose the topic for discussion. So if you have any questions concerning mental health issues, give me a call in the Fort Wayne area by dialing 969-2720. But if you're calling coast to coast, you may call toll-free at 866-969-2720. Now on a fairly regular basis, we are broadcasting live every Monday night from our spectacular PBS Fort Wayne studios which lie in the shadows of the Purdue Fort Wayne campus and if you have any questions that I can answer on the uh, answer on the air you may write me at uh, the email of matters of the mind all one word at wfwa.org that's matters of the mind at wfwa.org I'll start tonight's program with a question I recently received it reads dear Dr. Favre I've been self-medicating with marijuana for my stress I've tried counseling and it doesn't help as well what as marijuana. What can I do? Well, cannabis uh, is something that, if, especially if you're under 24 years of age, can suppress the growth of the white matter of your brain. So it can cause you to have trouble with processing information and basically, literally, decrease your IQ over the course of time. So if you're under 24 years of age, you really need to find other means of helping you with relaxation other than marijuana. Now, there are a lot of behavioral techniques. I mean, going back to simply exercising as a means of helping you relax can be a start. Aerobic exercise, where you're trying to get your heart rate increased, is very good for a lot of people who suffer from depression. But a lot of people will notice that they have stress relief when they use resistance or weight training. So there's different types of exercise that can be helpful for different types of psychiatric symptoms. A lot of people will notice that if they uh, will change their diet in some ways, that sometimes will help their ability to tolerate stress and everybody's different and you just have to track what seems to work for you. So for some people it might be a low carb diet, other people will be intermittent fasting. It all depends on what works for you in terms of helping you with anxiety and stress. But quite frankly, the first thing we'll often do when we hear about somebody using marijuana on a regular basis is realizing that they're using it for a reason. Many people will use cannabis as a means of helping with decreasing anxiety because cannabis makes you not care as much. And it just decreases anxiety in, in the sense that it makes you a little bit more apathetic. And in, unfortunately, it can decrease motivation. And that's why I always will tell Oh, 18, 19 year olds going off to college to don't use mar marijuana because if they use it, that's a, a key factor in terms of their having difficulty staying in school because if they use marijuana when they're under stress, it makes them not care and they can withdraw from classes and it can affect them socially as well. Many people when they start using marijuana when they're 13 or 14 years of age and use it regularly through high school and even into their 20s and into their early 30s will be in their early 30s and they'll have not uncommonly the emotional maturity of somebody who might be an early adolescent when they started using marijuana simply because marijuana basically not only stunts the growth of the brain but I think it stunts the emotional uh, growth as well. So people will have difficulty over the course of time being able to emotionally grow and uh, and be able to adapt to their environment. Anxiety is common during your adolescence, especially in social situations. We should all learn how to adapt with that type of anxiety and learn from it. If you use marijuana, you don't care and you go through your adolescence and into your early adult years uh, not really learning those experiences of coping with those social situations. So with that in mind, uh, we'll often use a medication like gabapentin as a means of helping people get off marijuana. Now marijuana will affect the cannabinoid receptors that are in the brain and give you a calming effect, but uh, gabapentin will affect the calcium channels in such a way that it'll make the little neurons less prone to fire abnormally high if you're under a lot of anxiety. So the gabapentin will help with uh, de decreasing the anxiety in that matter by uh, uh, decreasing the excessive firing of the neuron. It'll also indirectly affect the limbic system here. This little uh, amygdala right here with followed by the limbic system up here. Um, going up through the hippocampus of the brain. The limbic system is in the inside part of the brain and that is what controls your anxiety and helps you cope and tolerate th things. And the limbic system, the amygdala, which is the anxiety and, and anger and rage center of the brain right there, that is communicating with the front part of the brain, which is the reasoning part of the brain. So what you're trying to do when you're trying to treat anxiety is often, okay, dial up 
the uh, front part of the brain so the front part of the brain can help you think through your life circumstances and thereby dampen down the firing of the amygdala and decrease the overall uh, activity of the limbic system so that you don't feel overwhelmed by stress. So what we'll often do is give people some behavioral techniques to help them get off the marijuana, but also we can't ignore that marijuana does have physical effects on the brain in terms of helping with anxiety. And if you stop marijuana abruptly, one of the symptoms can be extreme anxiety and difficulty with sleep. And not uncommonly when people uh, are, are stopping marijuana abruptly, if they've been using heavy doses, they'll have vomiting. So marijuana withdrawal is sometimes can be characterized by vomiting, projectile vomiting, where it can be very serious. So we have to take that into account and we'll often help them detoxify off of marijuana when they've been using it. But especially before the age of 24 years of age, when the brain is still growing, the white matter of the brain typically is suppressed by the use of marijuana. That's the part of the brain that forms the insulin all around the little neurons. And it, if, uh, it forms the um, uh, insulation around the little neurons. And if you dampen that laying down of the insulation around the neurons, you'll have difficulty communicating from neuron to neuron. Matthew, well, thanks for your email. Let's go to our first caller. Hello, Matthew, welcome to Matters of the Mind. Matthew, you want, to know, you want to know how you can relax when you have intrusive thoughts. When you have intrusive thoughts, I believe, Matthew, you're referring to thoughts that you don't really want to have. Now, sometimes those are just annoying thoughts that can be somewhat distracting. And in those cases, it's important to try to focus on something else. That's a simple answer. Yeah, I mentioned earlier the impact of exercising. Exercising can help you kind of chill out. Exercising typically relaxes people. Many people don't want to exercise until they do it. And then after they exercise, they not only feel a, a sense of satisfaction from exercising, but they feel calm, but yet they feel energized at the same time. And there's a neurobiological reason for that. When you exercise, you increase both your stimulating neurotransmitter called glutamate, which is in the outside part of the brain, and you also increase your calming chemical called GABA, gamma aminobutyric acid. So if you increase both the accelerator and the braking neurochemistry in the outside of the brain, you can feel energized, but yet calm at the same time. So this is why we'll often recommend to people that they exercise 30 to 40 minutes Maybe three times a week would be nice. Five times a week is even better. But getting some kind of exercise, especially if you have difficulty with anxiety and intrusive thoughts, that can be very helpful. Now, Matthew, there are types of intrusive thoughts that we truly call obsessions. Obsessions are due to this inside loop of the brain here. This is the brain looking at you, and this inside here is uh, has a loop. And if that loop gets stuck, you tend to think about things that you don't want to think about, and you know they don't make any sense, and they just keep coming around and around. Those are called Called obsessions and it's kind of like the old record players where the needle got stuck and the way we break that up not uncommonly will be with high doses of medications that increase serotonin and that's a way of breaking up that loop but that's a psychiatric condition called obsessive compulsive disorder obsessions sometimes are followed by compulsions where you do things over and over and over again even though you realize you don't need to do them again such as cleaning or checking or or uh, ruminating about something, and you know you don't have to uh, keep doing these things over and over again, but you feel like you have to to get away from it. So uh, obsessions come time, sometimes can be accompanied by compulsions, but the obsessions are the, are the uh, type of behaviors where you have thoughts and they don't make sense to you, but they annoy you, and the more you try to get them off your mind, off your mind, the worse it can get sometimes. So one way that you can kind of break up that loop, the going round and round with the obsession, is simply in your mind or out loud, if you can do it, say stop. If you say stop, you activate this left front part of the brain, and that sometimes can break up that loop. It's a simple technique, but if you simply think very clearly in your mind or say it out loud, stop when you have those obsessive thoughts, go to immediately start thinking about something else, that can be really helpful. We, have, we see the same thing with dreams. Uh, and when you awaken from a dream, if it was a, a vivid dream, the dream over the course of the morning often will be erased unless you talk about it. Now, if you talk about it and you start trying to think about what that dream was all about or you write it down, you can study your dreams in that manner. But more often than not, people will have dreams and those dreams will kind of fade away like a puff of smoke over the course of the morning. The same thing can happen with obsessions if you redirect your thinking to something else. 
Thanks for your call. Let's go to our next caller. Hello, Lewis. Welcome to Matters of the Mind. Good evening. I was wondering if you could explain the blood-brain barrier and what can cross over and what can't cross over and, and why. The blood-brain barrier, Lewis, is basically a nice little sheath all around the brain, and some things can cross over, th some things can't. I always find it interesting that insulin cannot cross over the blood-brain barrier. Glucose needs to, but insulin can't. But it was just discovered recently that there are insulin receptors in the brain. So these insulin receptors must have other effects other than just insulin, but they have effects on other types of chemicals. So the brain basically is fueled by glucose. About 20% of all of your energy expended in the whole body throughout the day is expended in your brain. So it's a highly active uh, type of phenomenon here, but it will not allow certain things to cross over, and that includes medications, that includes uh, molecules that are too large, uh, some uh, type of uh, chemicals can cross over, some can't. Tryptophan, for instance, can cross over. A tryptophan is a building block for serotonin, but serotonin can't cross over. So you have to have these little byproducts and uh, these little bu building blocks of a lot of chemicals for them to cross over to be able to build the chemicals in the brain. Now, some of the chemicals are built by build the building blocks that are actively pumped into the brain across the blood-brain barrier, and some aren't. Now, uh, Lewis, one of the factors that we see with some of the neurodegenerative conditions is that sometimes that blood-brain barrier breaks down and stuff starts getting in that shouldn't be getting in and that can cause infections and a lot of toxicity. So we're always considering what crosses over the blood-brain barrier. Some medications do more so than others. So some medications will cross across the blood-brain barrier and we'll use those selectively to try to help people with uh, getting more of a calming effect. Other medications might not cross across the blood-brain barrier and we'll use those as a means of helping with the symptoms in uh, the rest of the body. So we take that in consideration, but it's basically just kind of a netting all around the brain and it selectively lets some things in and doesn't let other things in uh, overall. It uh, has uh, its own defense mechanism. We've got our little white blood cells on the outside part of the brain and macrophages are part of that white blood cell system. That's outside the brain, the rest of the body. So you got these macrophages that just kind of chew up bacteria. Well, the macrophages don't get inside the brain. Inside the brain, we have the same kind of cells, but they're called microglia. Entirely different, but they are also chewing up bacteria and things that get inside the brain. So inside the brain, you got microglia. Outside the body, in the rest of the body, you've got the little white cells that are called macrophages. So there's different ways of fighting off infection in the brain versus outside the body. Lewis, thanks for your call. Let's go to the next caller. Hello, Robert, welcome to Mayor's of the Mind. Robert, you had mentioned you had gastric, uh, gast gastrointestinal issues for many years, but your doctor says you're fine. Is there any connection between the gut and the brain? Yeah, you know, Robert, the gut is extensively hooked up to the brain, and we really can't separate it, separate the two of them. Uh, about 80% of the body's serotonin is in the gut. So when we talk about serotonin disturbances, which in the brain can cause trouble with anxiety, depression, uh, premenstrual symptoms, obsessions, as I mentioned earlier, panic disorder, social anxiety, those can be all affected by serotonin transmission. And it's thought that women have about 20% less serotonin uh, transmission than men, and that's one of the reasons why women are much more prone to anxiety and some depressive disorders. So when we think about the gut, we've got to think about how it's able to process different chemicals. And, uh, you know, there, there's uh, probiotics, which are basically means by which you can change the bacteria of your, of your uh, gut, and in doing so, that improvement with gut health overall can affect sometimes the transmission of the chemicals in the brain. We don't have a really good understanding on that just yet, but every year or so, you're, you're hearing more, about, more and more about things in terms of how we can improve gut health. I don't think we're really at a point where we can treat most psychiatric conditions by just giving somebody a probiotic or giving them intestinal bacteria to improve their intestinal flora and thereby affect their mood and anxiety, but I think we're getting closer as time goes on to understanding that. And when you have intestinal bacteria that uh, are not really favorable for the absorption of some medications, that can sometimes make some medications not very well absorbable. So that can be a factor as well. So um, I, I think we're gonna be learning more about 
gastrointestinal issues as they relate to, to brain issues over the course of time. But for instance, if somebody has uh, panic attacks, they can have diarrhea associated with their having difficulty with panic attacks. It's not uncommon that we'll hear about people having heartburn and stomach ache when they get under a lot of stress. Other people will get constipated when they get under stress because with higher adrenaline, you have a constipating effect. So there's different phenomena that we, we, can, we can hear about. And as a psychiatrist, I'll often be exploring the type of irritable bowel somebody might, ex might, might have because based on the type of irritable bowel symptoms they have, I can choose different medications that might not only affect their mood and anxiety, but also affect their overall gastric motility. Robert, thanks for your call. Let's go to our next caller. Hello, Dan. Welcome to Mayors of the Mind. Dan, you want to know if you, you should stop taking your um, antipsychotic medication if you're having surgery. Dan, you specifically mentioned antipsychotic medication, which typically is not a, a factor prior to surgery, so we would not really um, find that somebody would have to stop their antipsychotic medication prior to surgery. Just make sure your anesthesiologist knows that you've been on a certain medications. And the reason people have to stop certain medications prior to surgery will be, number one, if the medication can be associated with, with more bleeding. So medications that are associated with increased bleeding can be the serotonin reuptake medications, such as Zoloft, Paxil, Selexa, Lexapro, and Prozac. Those are all SSRIs. Sometimes SNRIs, serotonin norepinephrine reuptake inhibitors, such as Cymbalta, Pristique, Fitzema, or Effexor, they can sometimes and give you enough of a serotonin reuptake inhibition to make the platelets less sticky and increase bleeding as well. So that's the number one factor we'll often hear about when we're talking about psychiatric medications in general. We don't want to increase bleeding during surgery. Secondly, based on what kind of anesthesia you might get, we'll sometimes not want people to take certain medications that might interfere with the metabolism of the anesthesia. And uh, the anesthesiologist can often discuss that with you or with us as clinicians. So we want, don't want to have drug interactions. That can be a factor. And the third factor can be if you're going to get pain medications after the surgery, and many people do. We don't want them on the so-called benzodiazepine medications, such as Xanax, Clodopin, Ativan, Valium. Those medications will amplify the um, the pain medications affects, and you might think, well, that's a good thing, right? Well, unfortunately, it can also not only just improve the pain and amplify the pain medications effect for pain, but also can shut down your breathing. So those kind of medications are not recommended with narcotic or opiate medications. The gabapentinoids, such as pregabalin or gabapentin, uh, aren't as bad. They can to some degree, but we're getting away from using the gabapentinoid medications with opiates as well. But they appear to be safer than the benzodiazepines. But those are the three main reasons we'd have people uh, taper off or stop their medication prior to a surgery. If the medication is going to increase bleeding, if it's going to change the metabolism of anything during anesthesia, and thirdly, if there's any interaction with narcotic medication. Thanks for your call. Let's go to our next caller. Hello, Janet. Welcome to Marathon Mind. Janet, you want to know if there's any new medication on the market for bipolar level, uh, disorder type 2 and uh, which medications are the, are the most effective? That's always uh, debatable, Janet. Basically, bipolar disorder type 2 is where you'd have anywhere between four and six days of hypomania where you're talking faster, you're more energetic, you're not sleeping as much, a little, little bit more impulsive, but it's not getting you into a lot of trouble. So the highs are called hypomania. Uh, spells and they're not getting you into trouble, but they're there. And unfortunately, after having a four to six day high, you crash into over two weeks of depression. So this is a condition that's been very difficult to treat over the course of time. There are medications that, that are being studied for a bipolar disorder type two because you're mainly wanting to affect the downside of um, the spectrum of, of depression. In my experience over the course of time, bipolar disorder type two can be uh, treated with such medications as Caplida, Seroquel, Lunest, uh, 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 Latuda, Lunesta was on my mind, it's a sleep medication, Latuda and um, a medication, it's been around for a long time, called Lamictal. Lamictal is an anti-epileptic medication, and as an anti-epileptic medication, it tends to stabilize the glutamate transmission and thereby can decrease the likelihood of people having highs or lows. So right now, well, the main medications I'm seeing used for bipolar disorder type 2 
can be some medications that been around for a long time, uh, Latuda, Caplita, Seroquel, Lamictal. Uh, we're starting to see Vralar used at low doses for several people because low doses seem to be a, nicely um, helping people with the mood instability of having the highs and lows. So uh, I, I think over the course of time, we'll be hearing more about medications that are affecting glutamate directly in helping people with depression, especially bipolar disorder, disorder type two depression. We've had it, uh, ketamine out uh, as an anesthetic since 1970, and it's been used off label without Food and Drug Administration approval formally since uh, about uh, the year 2000. Esketamine's been available since 2019, and that's a nasal intranasal spray that uh, is used for treatment resistant depression. But I think over the course of time, esketamine, maybe Alvelity uh, being another one, those are medications that can affect glutamate. And I think over the course of time, they might be researched more for depression as well as mood stability. So there's a lot of things coming down the pike for bipolar disorder type two, but that's a condition that's very difficult to study because it only involves just a few days of the little highs, but then the big lows. So you know, if you just treat the lows, that's great. You can bring somebody out of the lows, but they might inadvertently go into the highs. And over the course of time, the more frequently they have the little highs, the higher the highs get and the more prolonged they become. And you bet about one out of five people will have bipolar two disorder early on and they can convert into bipolar disorder type one, type one being where the manic episodes emerge and they occur over the course of seven days or more and they get you into trouble. So when somebody's having a full-blown manic episode that's considered to be bipolar one disorder, these people don't need to sleep sometimes for days. They will talk extremely fast, they'll be very impulsive and um, they'll do things and say things they ordinarily shouldn't do or say, and they get themselves into trouble. And I have seen people get arrested because of, of, of regrettable outbursts they might have during the manic episodes themselves. So bipolar one disorder is where somebody has distinctive manic episodes. Bipolar two disorder is where people will have little highs and big lows. The key with bipolar two disorder is even though Patients will tell us all about the depressive episodes. We have to search for those little highs because if they're having little highs, we need to give them a little bit of a mood stabilizer. And I mentioned those mood stabilizers being medications like Lamotrigine or Lamictal, uh, Latuda, Caplita, Seroquel, Vralar. These kind of medications act more as mood stabilizers. And we try to get people on the medications that's going to level out their mood, not on unlike what you'd see with the cruise control. I was just talking to somebody about that today. When we give mood stabilizers, we're giving them basically a cruise control on the mood. We don't want them to go too high or too fast or too low or too slow. So we want them to kind of be leveled out. We don't want them to be a zombie where they just don't have any emotions at all. That's not good. But we don't want them to have unnatural highs and lows because that's what gets people into trouble. Janet, thanks for your call. Let's go to our next email question if we have that, and we do. Here it is. It reads, Dear Dr. Favre, we lost my husband fairly recently, and it has been hard on all of us, but my teen has stopped talking. At first, I thought he needed time, but it's been almost a month. What should I do? If your teen is really withdrawn, that's where you can get to the point where it, be goes, it goes beyond grieving. Now, normal grieving, my goodness, it should involve sadness, crying spells. You should be reminiscing about the loss of a loved one. That's perfectly appropriate. But when you get to the point where you withdraw socially, you can't get things done every day, you're not eating properly, you're not sleeping, that becomes well, what used to be called a pathological grief, now we simply call it a major depression. And when you have a pathological grief, you could have difficulty with uh, uh, the chemical disturbances in the brain that are causing you to have a, a chemical depression, which we call a major depression. And when that happens, it's worth treating because the longer it goes on, the more difficult it can be and it can be very persistent. And most importantly, when you have depressive symptoms like that for a long period of time, it can cause you to have what we call functional impairment. Functional impairment is where you can't socialize, you can't work, you can't go to school, you can't do the kind of things that you need to do every day and it paralyzes you. And it's like a dark cloud hanging over your head that doesn't go away. And 
you, you have to think about, okay, when you're, when you've lost a loved one, it's not treatment for depression is not going to bring the loved one back, but your perspective in terms of going at this day forward can often change. So that's where medication comes in. Talk therapy with grief counseling often focuses on that, how you can actually honor the loved one who's been lost by serving out your life the best way possible and going from this day forward. So it comes down to perspective overall. Let's go to our last question. Hello, Dean. Welcome to Myers the Mind. Dean, over this last minute or so, you'd mentioned that uh, felt like feels like you're swimming through mud. What are the s signs of depression? Well, let's go through some of them. It involves day by day difficulty with sad mood, low self esteem, trouble with appetite, sleep, difficulty with enjoying things, classic symptom, fatigue, sometimes crying spells, especially for women more so than men, but men get angry and irritable when they get depressed and thoughts of death and suicide can be symptoms. So those symptoms going on day by day for at least a couple weeks causing you difficulty getting things done. Those are the clinical signs of depression. And uh, we, we, we've we seen over the past six years that the rate of suicide in the United States has increased every single year for the past six years. That's where we need to recognize depression. We need to do something about it. Dean, thanks for your call. Unfortunately, I'm out of time for this evening. If you have any questions that I can answer on the air concerning mental health issues, you can give me a call this next week or just write me via the internet at mattersthemind at wfwa.org. I'm psychiatrist Jay Falver, and you've been watching Matters of the Mind, which is also now available on YouTube. God willing and PBS willing, I'll be back again next week. Thanks for watching. Good night.